Let us revisit our good friend adjusted R squared. Well, actually we're revisiting R squared and we're going to adjust it. R squared was a nice measure in simple linear regression, right? It's a percentage of the variation in, in our recent example, alumni giving, explained by the model, understandable, you know, it's really easy to interpret, wonderful measure of goodness of fit. However, there is a dark side to this particular goodness of fit measure. The empire has taken it over. And the problem is, if you add a variable to the model, R squared will never go down. Likely it'll go up. Now you go, okay, hey, adding variables to the model, maybe they're predictive, have more predictive ability. What's wrong with that? And I mean any variable. So for instance, we're making a model of alumni giving and we add uh, the number of black t-shirts I saw on a Tuesday afternoon on June the 12th while I was out at the mall. Now you go, what the hell does that have to do, have to do anything with alumni giving? And it doesn't. But <laughs> adding that variable will never decrease your R squared. In fact, it might increase it just a little bit. So it gives you the impression, okay, well, you add it into the model. And you add other crap variables into the model. Next thing you know, you've sort of artificially juiced up your R squared. Uh, and you remember the old uh, saying, garbage in, garbage out. Well, this is adding crap and thinking that you've, uh, you've discovered diamonds or something like that. Okay, So we want to dissuade this particular type of bad statistical behavior. And one of the ways that we dissuade this kind of bad statistical behavior is by adjusting this R squared to penalize for just including, for including those extraneous parameters. If the parameter belongs, good, 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 good R squared will go up. Adjusted R squared will also go up. Uh, but if that's a if it's a extraneous parameter, the, not a very good variable, adjusted R squared can go down, right? penalty, and you can actually end up with a lower adjusted R squared because you added a bad variable or a variable that really doesn't belong. Right? Whereas plain old R squared never goes down even if you add the dumbest of, of variables. In fact, it may even go up just a smidgen, even with an extraneous variable has nothing to do with the response variable or the dependent variable you're trying to predict. So uh, when we have multiple linear regression, adjusted R squared is the way we want to go. If we have simple linear regression, well, you only have one independent variable, you can use old-fashioned plain R squared. So little distinction. It can get uh, easy to forget that word adjusted. Use the adjusted R squared in the multiple linear regression case because of this sort of sinister aspect of adding extraneous variables to your model. Try to remember that because, uh, again, it's really easy to mix up. Interpretations, however, are still the same. So we have, there's three different formulas for adjusted R squared. They'll all get you the same result. Usually which one you pick depends on how you're calculating it. For instance, if you look at the very first one, that's where we got R squared adjusted equals to one minus, and then in brackets, one minus R squared, and then in another set of brackets, N minus one divided by N minus P minus one. In that case, if you're calculating this by hand, you know, using a calculator, I don't mean by hand in the old old fashioned way, by hand I mean by you're using a calculator, this formula is the easiest one. Because if you kind of miss a, a decimal, if you miss a des you get the wrong number, num wrong numeral in the ten thousandths place, not really gonna influence your R squared adjusted too much. Um and so it's the nice one to use when you're doing the calculation with just you, a pencil, paper, and a calculator. The other two are very nice 
if you're referencing uh, items on an Excel sheet. So if you're doing referencing, everything here is, is an item on that Excel output. Okay. And, and so if you're referencing items on that Excel output, the other two are easier because there's just fewer references to do. Okay. Fewer brackets to contend with. Uh, and it doesn't much matter. I mean, if you're referencing where SSE is, and SSE is usually a big number, right? And, and you, miss a, you miss that last number. Well, you're out by tens, uh, by a factor of 10, if you just miss that one last number. Uh, and so you don't like to do it by, by hand in calculator because it's easy to miss that last number. You got nine, you got nine digits to this thing and you miss the 10th digit. That's a radically different number. So, but if you're referencing, if you're just doing cell references, well, it doesn't matter. Excel's going to pick up every single one of those, uh, those digits anyway, so no big deal. It can be pretty easy just to use uh, the other two. Okay. And sometimes in the lab, they, they'll t tend to trend to use uh, probably this one over here because it's the absolute easiest one to use. Uh, but, you know. It, it could it could vary, but this is usually the second one with the SSE and the SST. That's the easiest one when you're doing cell references to do on Excel. Okay, but the, again, reiterate, they all give you the same answer. Okay, so it's not like, oh, which one should I use? Well, use the one that works best for you in that particular situation. Okay. So if you're in an exam situation and you're allowed to use Excel, then maybe you'll do it the way they show you in the lab which is probably going to be this R squared adjusted uh, with the one minus SSE divided by the SST and then in brackets N minus one N minus P minus one. If you're, if you're doing it without, a calcul without Excel, then the very first one in the top left will, might, will be the easiest one for you to use. Okay. Okay. And so we, we, still, we still use that adjusted R squared and we still in the, now we interpret that adjusted R squared as we interpreted R squared previously. Standard error of the estimate of the equation, its interpretation stayed the same, stays the same throughout any aspect of linear regression, regardless of whether we're talking about one independent variable or many independent variables. Okay. So let's look at, let's go back and we'll go look at the output and we'll look at how the alumni giving talks about. Now we, we, we did do a little bit of discussion when we first saw that output, but we'll do a little, we'll do it one more time. Okay. So now because it's got multiple parameters, multiple variables, right? We're, we're interested in adjusted R squared and we see that that's 0 0.67948. So roughly 0.68. So 68% of the variation in alumni giving alumni giving is our independent variable, our dependent variable, excuse me, is explained by this model. So 68% of the variation in alumni giving is explained by this model. That's it. Standard error just gives us uh, how widely dispersed the actual observations are around this particular line. A smaller number is always preferred to a larger number. And this just says that if we make any estimate for alumni giving. So we're given a certain scenario, a certain uh, graduation rate, a certain percentage of classes under 20, a certain faculty ratio, and we make a prediction exactly the same as what we did with tweet rate and movie revenues in the simple linear regression case. We make that prediction and then whatever prediction we get, because alumni giving is expressed as in terms of percentage points, whatever prediction we get plus or minus 7.6 percentage points is where we expect the uh, an actual observation or the actual observation to lie 68% of the time plus or minus whatever our prediction is okay. maybe I'll say that again plus or minus for 68 68% of the time we would expect that uh, our the actual value will be plus or minus 7.6 percentage points relative to our predicted value we would also expect that the actual observation to be plus or minus two times 7.6 percentage points within our forecast or within our prediction, 95.44% uh, of the time. 
So not as nice and clean an interpretation as adjusted R squared, but it does give you a sense for the dispersion and that when you make a prediction, uh, the range of possible estimate, a range of possible values for that prediction. And that, that can be pretty, that, that's pretty useful as well. So uh, we'll just finish this up uh, with a little bit of model uh, assumptions and a short discussion on normality. So the assumptions, there's four assumptions, and they're exactly the same as they were for the simple linear regression case. The first assumption is that the expected value of the errors is zero. And by the just, the, just by using the least squares regression technique, the errors will be restricted to their average value or their expected value will be restricted to being zero. So that first assumption, well important, gets forced into being just by the nature of the least squares regression model calculation. The second, uh, third uh, assumptions are a little trickier. Uh, for second assumption is that all the variances for all the x's or for all the values are constant. And that can be a tricky one, and that one's a one that's often violated, okay? uh, especially when you're dealing with things like income, housing prices. Uh, that variance isn't equal across all incomes or all house prices or all stock portfolio levels. Okay? So that one gets violated a lot, and it leads to a lot of problems, and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss those problems a little later on. The third one is that the errors can't be related to each other. And we call that autocorrelation. And that one can get violated quite a bit because, let's face it, if you're talking about income over time, well, how much I earn this period, typically, COVID accepted maybe, how much I earn this period was highly dependent on how much I earned last period. Okay, so. Uh, and and so on. So those are, those are somewhat related, and so autocorrelation is, is a particular problem. And we'll talk about that uh, after the second midterm later on. The fourth uh, assumption is that the errors, and by extension the observations, are normally distributed, which is something we'll talk about in a few minutes. There are tests for normality, but we're just going to kind of focus just just because you know, we vote you know one class only so much time, and we'll focus more on just a, a graphical view of that. A couple of conditions is the sample size has to be large enough to give at least one degree of freedom for the inference procedures. That just means when one of our degrees of freedom is n minus p minus one, and we really can't have uh, the number of parameters and the number of uh, in the sample size to be the same. <laughs> or even be very close to each other. We want a lot of, we want a big difference between the sample size and the, the number of parameters. So you, can, you can sort of force the, the line to get you an R squared of 100% if you pick a, a number of parameters that's pretty close to the sample size. So, so we want to make sure we have a large enough sample size so that uh, we're not, you know, again, playing statistical games there. Okay. And uh, the second condition is there's no perfect multicollinearity. Multicollinearity is a problem that we'll be, we'll be discussing later on, and that is where the independent variables are related to each other. We're joyous when the independent variable is related to the dependent variable. When the x is related to the y, woohoo, that's what we're looking for. However, we don't like it when the x's are related to each other. Okay. That causes some potential problems. If, it's, if there's a perfect relation between one uh, x variable and another x variable, the linear algebra and the matrix inversions that go on behind the scenes for our regression calculation basically explode and you end up with sort of like a divide by zero problem with uh, calculating the determinant of the, of the matrix, matrix and so on. Okay, so we don't, we don't like that. So perfect multi multicollinearity it blows up our model. Sometimes Excel just gives you weird results, which is kind of like the sinister part of it. The model blew up. Excel didn't know what to do, so they spit out a bunch. They just basically puked up a bunch of stuff on the page, and you get some really weird answers, and you're going, what the heck? How? how yeah, I, ah, ah. And they go, ah, you know, 
Looks like there might be a little multicollinearity there. Perfect multicollinearity. A little bit of multicollinearity or a lot of multicollinearity, you'll still get results, but uh, they may be dubious. All right? So probability plot, probably something you saw in your first stats class. And, and, and so essentially what, what it does is it, it compares sort of what you got with what you'd expect to get, right? And uh, draws it out on, on a graph. And so we, we look at uh, where we're at, uh, you know, what, you know, and it splits it up at the percent, percent uh, percentiles. There's also what's called, this is called a P, uh, a probability plot, PP plot, uh, P plot. Um, it, there's also a Q, you know, where it splits it up at the quartiles. But, uh, we're working with percentiles here. And so if that line is uh, straight eh, and starting at zero, means it somewhat conforms with what we'd expect from a normal uh, distribution. Uh, deviations from that uh, suggest maybe a lack of normality. And when we talk deviations, it's we want it to be like really funky looking. This graph here, yeah, we're not quite starting at zero, but it's straightish. And yeah, this one out here is a little bit mm, not like the others. Uh, but, you know, wow, that's an impressive university. Well, they got like a 60 something percent alumni giving rate, eh? I mean, cl clearly some, something's going on here. I, you really like to look at best practices for this particular institution, but this one particular institution does not make this non-normal, let's put it that way. So it's sort of normal enough. It's kind of like human nature. Ah, yeah, we're all a little quirky. Uh, maybe we're not completely, uh, you know, normal so-called, but we're normal enough, and that's, that, that, that works for statistics as it does for life. And same thing here. Okay. When we come back, next segment we'll do tests for model significance and tests for the significance of a particular mentioned single coefficient. Stay tuned.